Good morning, brothers and sisters, as we return to this study and we open the word of the Lord. Shall we ask him for his guidance and his direction so that we may more carefully consider the items with which we are dealing? Shall we now now ask for his guidance? Loving Father in heaven, we need you. Help us as we consider the words of your prophet and we consider those that have commented upon this that our minds may be open to understand what you are trying to tell us so that we may weed through those things that are not necessary for our consideration, but from which we need to defend the faith that we have. Direct us now. Please be with us. Show us now the items that we need. Help us to draw closer together. In all ways and all things, for this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, several things have come up since this last week. The document that we were working with yesterday, published on the 11th of July of 1871. While it does not show it before you, if you were to take a look at this date, using the calendar converter, you would find that this document was published on the 22nd day of the fourth month on the biblical calendar, biblical year 5916. This is another one of these documents where you get exactly the same biblical day, same date, 22nd day of the fourth month on the biblical calendar, the rabbinic calendar and the Islamic calendar. So, so far, the first of the documents we looked at for this series on Daniel 12 was published on the 25th day of the second month on all three calendars. Now, we've been finding this very striking coincidence in several other places. Whether this is our Heavenly Father trying to get our attention, I don't know. But it's very different for us to be seeing all sorts of things that are lining up as we have been considering all of these studies. Now, where we left things yesterday, we came down here and we were addressing the question, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Now, we were discussing this portion of this paragraph when we came to the end of yesterday's meeting. Smith continued with the following paragraph. The 1260 years marks the period of papal supremacy. Why is this period here introduced? Probably because this power is the one which does more than any other in the world's long history in scattering the power of the holy people or oppressing the church of God. But what shall we understand by the expression shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people. A literal translation of the Septuagint seems to present it in a clearer light. When he shall have finished the scattering of the power of the holy people. To whom does the pronoun he refer? According to the wording of the scripture, the antecedent would at first sight seem to be him that liveth forever, O Jehovah, But as an eminent expositor of the prophecies judiciously remarks, in considering the pronouns of the Bible, we are to interpret them according to the facts of the case. Hence, must frequently refer to them to an antecedent understood rather than to some noun which is expressed. So here the little horn or man of sin having been introduced by the particular mention of the time of the supremacy, namely 1260 years, may be the power referred to by the pronoun he. Would we agree with Smith on this point? Okay, well, first a couple of things. Just going back about the dates of these things. So this this one is, is July 11th. So the last study is July 18th. And that one's going to be the 22nd day of... Or 25th day of the second month. No, the first. Right? No, that is incorrect. Oh, this one is. Oh, no, okay. So this no. one is. So this one is the 25th day of the second. Okay, you're right. And then the last study is going to be July 18th. 
Right. Right. Okay. This, and then from that last study to the first study, the date they gave us, which seems to be incorrect, because that goes back to 1868, January 5th. Did we ever resolve that? The best, the best we can tell right now is that when they were publishing, they were not very careful as to changing their typeset. Okay. Now, the, the, the situation that we have on the four articles that Smith made regarding Daniel 12, the first article that was published which I have placed as Daniel 12 sub A was uh -huh. published on the 16th of May of 1871. So that's going to be the first one on Daniel 12. 11. 12. Wow. Okay, so May, so, so in Daniel 12, they start on May 16th, 1871, and they finish on July 18th, 1871. Yes, and this, this is quite a, a frustration to Smith because they bumped his articles for a period of time in 1871. By the time we come to the final portion of Daniel 12, sub D, which we will get into today, he had a paragraph that he wrote, venting his frustration and that portion is not in any of his books so okay. this one that we're dealing with right now which is daniel 12 c as charlie was published on the 22nd day of the fourth month okay so, so july 11th correct okay now i got that straight so the first one is the 25th day of the second month. This is the 22nd day of the fourth month. Is there anything biblical that we have that would make this as to another relevant point for us at this moment? Not that I know of. Okay. And then the first article we had January 5th, 1868, which is 1290 days to the last one. But technically, that was just a typo. It was January 5th, 1869 that the first one is actually published. But they Correct. forgot to change the date on the type and the year, right? Which, which is a common thing people do, right? But it seems to be fairly common, especially in dealing with this with, with the Review and Herald articles. Yeah, but, you know, when somebody signs a check and they forget to write the new year in. Right. You know, so for January 5th to have the old year on there, you know, that's that's a common human error. Correct. Yeah, but but it's interesting that gives us 1290 to the last article. Otherwise, it's uh, uh, 1,227 days. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, 924 days. Right. Yeah. Now, from uh, the first article, we, if January 5th, 1869, to uh, the first one on Daniel 12, that is the one that's the 252, it's yes. uh, 861 days, which uh, has all of the digits of... 186, which is the number of cardinal days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. So I don't know if that's that significant. But I think this main thing, the July 18 date and then the 25th day of the second month. Now, Stephen makes a comment that um, the 25th day of the second month is the day of the accession of Christ, the ascension of Christ. I mean, the Christ ascends into heaven on the 25th day of the second month. Okay. So that's kind of that's interesting. Right. Because 10, 10, 10 days before uh, Pentecost. Right. Now, now technically, I mean, he is in the holy place, but he actually inaugurates his work uh, because the holy place is anointed at the same time the Holy Spirit is poured out. 
so I, I tend to count the beginning of his work in the holy place as, you know, Pentecost. I think you do too, Stephen, don't you? Well, Ellen White, she says that that was when he was able to sort of fully express you know, his power, to, to, to minister with power, you know, to give the full outpouring. Yeah. So there was, yeah. this seems to suggest that then first 10 days prior, that he was in, he was like a minister. You know, the, the well, she yeah. talks about, she, she talks about the disciples mm-hmm. who were able to know that they had someone before the throne of God in the heavenly sanctuary. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we don't know that, exactly. It wasn't, that. yeah, but it, it just seems to be, there seemed to be something of less power for them 10 days would seem to be suggested in what she's saying. But it's only when, Pentecost comes that there's like full whatever authority is like ratified that uh, they can just pour out the, the Holy Spirit without measure. It must be some, yeah, so it must be some kind of preparatory work yes. in, in the Holy I mean, to understand exactly what Christ is doing, we don't really know. But, I mean, he ascends into heaven. He's with his father. Um, but the work, the actual work of the holy place as far as uh, the ministration, the daily ministration, who knows? I mean, we don't really fully understand it, but I, we know that it's on Pentecost, but that's where we're going to count the days of his work in the holy place, right? You're going to count it from Pentecost when you did your study or not. When you yeah, yeah. I did, well, well, with initially I did it from the, Pentecost, but I had done some studies as, as well, just for the um, extra 10 days, but there was, it just seems to be that that was where it's more with full power, whatever. Well, the, the thing is, I would use the Pentecost because, you know, we have in um, uh, Millerite history and also in 457, Pentecost and the Day of Atonement uh, being specifically marked and especially in 457 because you have um the center of the chiasm there is pentecost between the first periods okay. of three days and then you know the day of atonement is the center of the chiasm between the next group of three days so so that means it points to those two dates specifically so i i would think that we would really mark pentecost as the date, right? Marking the seventy yes. weeks. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, I, I uh, thought that was an important point that it's the twenty fifth day of the second month that Christ descends into uh I never really thought about that date for some reason. Mm-hmm. And it's okay. uh if you're marking the series yet team seventy one, the twenty fifth day of the second month, so that would be in the biblical calendar that would be eighteen hundred and forty years. Difference. Okay. Interesting. So eighteen hundred and forty years from from Pentecost yeah. to this year, Daniel twelve being a subject. Yeah. Yeah, and it'd be eighteen hundred and forty years also uh, in uh, you know, on, on on the solar calendar too, because it, well, no, it wouldn't be. It's a different date, right? Okay, yes, a biblical date. It's 1,804 years for different dates. Okay. I see. Okay. Dwight, back to the question you were asking. Well, I'm I'm going to step in with one other point. We were just addressing that the first article was published on Daniel 12, on the 16th of May of 1871, right? Yeah, and um, interestingly, 31 AD, uh, May 16th is the, the it's the fifth day of the second month, so it's 20 days difference. Just to, to note, um, on the biblic from the biblical date, and that's just because of the shift of the calendar over time. Okay. And and that's the Gregorian, and it's May 18th. So if I go to, I should go to the Julian date. 
Um, but that's the Gregorian date. So that'd be a solar year. And then it'd be third day of the second month. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. So, um, yep. So we got the, these dates. And what, what other date was? When we go the, from the first, the first article on Daniel 12. Yeah. On the 16th of May. Yeah. To the second article on Daniel 12 which was published on the 4th of July, 1871. We have a time period, depending on how you wish to count for the days, of either 49 or 50 days. Okay. So it would be a jubilee. Yeah, okay. That was the one that I had asked about before. So so he's going to go, he's going to, it's going to be a space of time from the first article to the second? Yes. Okay. I wonder why he had to wait seven weeks to publish that. But here, you know, I have I have no answer. Mm. I just recognize that he was very frustrated. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. But interesting. In, in this case, I don't think this was a, you know, so much an interference of man as it is our heavenly Father stepping in. And giving us a symbol for this time because we've got the 252, Christ returning to heaven and the Jubilee all pointing to the conclusion articles published on the 18th of July of 1871. Mm -hmm. I look at this as a validation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, okay, so thanks for that. And um, I think, you know, people can think maybe, you know, we're making too much about these dates, and uh, but I think they're extremely powerful symbols. So, uh, especially since this is Daniel chapter 12, right, which deals with the 1290 and the 1335 and the 1260, and, and the fact that um, this whole study on Daniel uh, 10, 11, and 12, the, what we have come to understand is that Daniel is being given this understanding of the 2520 in its in in much more detail that has been missed out by the church and Uriah Smith does not notice this so so he isn't fully grasping um, the significance of the 1260 here that's talked about the the first period for the scattering of the power of the holy people. So um, so he's trying to make this argument about, well, one is he goes to the Septuagint. I'm not sure why the Septuagint would be any significance. It's just a translation of, of the Hebrew done a long time ago. I mean, I would look at the Hebrew. I wouldn't really care what the Septuagint says if I'm going to care about anything. But isn't this Smith following his pattern to look more to Jansenius for his understanding than it is to looking to the scripture? Yeah, well, I think I think with Smith, the weakness that he has, because he he definitely tries to follow the pioneers. So he's he's not he's not trying to be a trailblazer on on um, you know new interpretations or anything. He he's he really sticks to what the pioneers had taught except that he's trying to do something that, that our church has been trying to do for a long time, and that is to be um, accepted within <laughs> excuse me, the scholarly community, right? So there's just this impression, if we can be more scholarly, refer to, uh, you know, the Hebrew Dictionary or the Septuagint, that that's going to have weight in sort of impressing people that we are not just a bunch of uh, country bumpkins, you know, studying the Bible. Uh, would you agree with me on that? I'm not going to disagree with you. Yeah, because I, I think that's, you know, that, that idea that somehow we need, and, and it's the same sort of appeal to science. You know, we must be scientific. We must be, um, 
you, we want to be accepted. <laughs> and, and we see this with um, Prescott especially, not wanting to depart from what the, the scholars say. So, I mean, that's why we end up rejecting the 2300 days and the 70 weeks um, within Adventism today is because, well, the other people disagree with us. So, and, and, and it has to do with how we're studying. So this, is, so this is planting the seeds of something that's going to bear fruit later on. Now, if you look at somebody like Jay and Andrews and his study, he's actually quite a bit different than you guys, Smith, in, in that he doesn't really, um, it doesn't appear to me when I read Jay and Andrews stuff that he has that same sort of desire. It's kind of an, an undertone of Smith that he's trying to appeal to that, that audience trying to put himself in that place as, as a scholar. And, you know, it's a little bit subjective in trying to understand that with an individual. We don't really know their heart. Some people accuse me of that because I am scholarly. But um, I don't ever think, you know, never have a desire to be recognized as a scholar and never, um, I don't take what anybody says is, is very important. I don't need any validation, but I, I feel anyway that Uriah Smith is looking for that type of validation. And that's why he would appeal to the Septuagint here. There's no need to, right, in this point, uh, to, to refer to the Septuagint. He could easily just, um, um, because when, when you look at the verse itself, it says, and when he shall have accomplished to out of the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. That's what the King James says. And and just, you know, he's going to say, when he shall have finished the scattering of the power of the holy people. Well, to me, I don't even see the difference. You know, what's the difference from finish the scattering or uh, shall have finished the, to scatter or shall uh, accomplish to scatter? So, he, I mean, he's going to look at finished and accomplished. Is that what he's addressing? I'm not sure whether that's even different. And then he's going to talk about, you know, he, he has this Septuagint. It, it's, it's totally unneeded, I guess, is my point. He could leave that sentence out completely. Now, Smith was completing this by saying for 1260 years, he had grievously oppressed the church or scattered their power. After his supremacy is taken away, his disposition toward the truth and its advocate still remains, and his power is still felt to a certain extent. And he continues his work of oppression just as far as he is able. Till when? Till the last of the events brought to view in verse 1, the deliverance of God's people, every one that is found written in the book. Being thus delivered, persecuting powers are no longer able to oppress them. Their power is no longer scattered. The end of the wonders brought to view in this great prophecy is reached, and all its predictions are accomplished. Now, well, uh, a point here that yes. needs to be uh, uh, addressed. So he's going to deal with the he. So he's going to say, well, the he is the little horn, right? Correct. And he's going to make this thing about the antecedent and so forth, which we know in Hebrew that doesn't mean anything, right? So the he could refer to almost anything as long as it's masculine. And uh, so we have here the little horn of the man of sin he's going to bring in here. The question is, uh, would we agree with him on this point? So is this referring to God scattering the power of the holy people? If so, God scatters the power of the holy people through paganism, right? Correct. So, I mean, even if paganism is the one doing the scattering, he still can refer to God doing it. Okay. We, we would, yeah. So, so if we're going to try to look at what the he's referring to, I mean, I would still think it refers to the Christ as the one doing the scattering of the powers of holy people. Yeah, but it is through the means of of uh, paganism. Now he has it here being through Rome, uh, that is papal Rome. But I believe that it's actually pagan Rome that accomplishes the scattering of the power of the holy people. And if we think about it in the context of, first you have, uh, like for northern Israel, you have Assyria. So Assyria does successfully scatter northern Israel. 
but then you still have Judah and it's going to come under the power of Babylon. And there is a captivity that occurs there, the Babylonian captivity, but under Medo-Persia, they're going to be returned uh, to Jerusalem. And then they're going to be oppressed by Greece, but they're not going to be scattered by Greece specifically in the sense of, um, you know, there isn't a, a type of captivity at all. And then under Rome, that's when they're going to accomplish the scattering of the power of the holy people. That's going to be under pagan Rome. <clears throat> right? So we're going to see, obviously, the destruction of the temple and uh, what's called the diaspora. And it that is really just being dispersed, right? Scattered. So, so that's going to happen under pagan Rome. And that's going to happen in that first time, times and a half that's given to do that. So the persecutions that happen to Christians, we often talk about, but the Jews are also being persecuted in that history. And then you're going to have the papacy come that's going to be the power that uh, treads, going to tread under the city 40, underfoot the city 40 in two months, Revelation 11, and we see that it stamps the residue with its feet, that's going to be the papacy. So, so he just misses this out completely because he doesn't understand the twenty-five twenty. Right. I mean, if he if he'd come to understand the the period of the seven times as that of the daily and the power that maketh desolate, twelve sixty for each, as Hiram Edson was trying to present. I think he would have had an entirely different outcome throughout this study. Now, and this is really important because, you know, often we talk about the rejection of the 2520, and I was thinking about it. I mean, I really am of the view that the 2520 was hidden from from the church. Okay. That is, if you look at how Ellen White refers to it sort of in, in an oblique fashion, right? Instead of coming out directly and saying, you know, the 2520 is a valid time period and we need to continue studying this, she she refers to it, but doesn't. And, and same with James White, and and I have a hard time figuring out whether Ellen White is aware of it consciously, or whether it's just something that even was hid to her from recognizing. Sorry about the dog barking outside my window. Um, so, but I take the position that it was hidden. And even though we have that seven year period from when Hiram Edson publishes his articles till the making of the 1863 chart, which I think, of course, is a symbolic period of time. So, 1856 to uh, 1863, that they have that time to consider. I really think it is just hidden. And um, so, it, it's. You know, and that's why, you know, I said, you know, I don't really think that Uriah Smith is rejecting it. I think that it's just hid from his eyes and it's to be revealed in our time. That that's my understanding of it, that God. And, and we could say it's because of the rebellion of of Adventists, you know, it's because they're laying to see it. But it was hid to be revealed at this time. That is, we wouldn't have had the ability to really put it all together back then. And it's much more significant that we find it now at the end of the world when the Adventist church has rejected the 2300 days and the 70 weeks and the 1260 and the 391 years and 15 days. And this movement has uncovered these things. And, and the one point that I think always has to be stressed is about the sealing up of the seven thunders. So when we address the seven thunders, that are going to seal up Millerite history. I believe that that's, that includes the understanding of the 2520 and the prophetic waymarks in Millerite history, that these things are sealed up. And this movement has specifically unsealed Millerite history. So even though there is, and, and, and this is a question that people um, ask me, and, I, and, and Felix here has asked me, um, which I, I think I can give him a better answer because 
He says, well, what's, what's the importance of the chronology? Why, why are we doing this? All of this, these dates and, and spans of time. And, and I believe it's, it's really the unsealing of Millerite history to understand Millerite history, um, that, that this movement exists. And that's why what's happening with Jeff at the present time and, and FFA um, has actually missed the whole point of this movement. Because once you get rid of the symbolic use of numbers, then Millerite history becomes meaningless. And especially the line upon line um, that we have been using um, to place all of these events and to parallel all of these histories together if you get rid of the symbolic use of numbers, you don't have anything to tie them together, really. Or at least they're not tied together in any solid way. They're much more subjective. So if we look at what we did with uh, the Book of Judges, because I'm going over Judges with uh, the brother from Vietnam. And I mean, it's all of these, these symbols, these symbolic numbers that help us to place all of this history together and to see the parallels. And so that, that was missed out. So there's, so we can say that, you know, thoughts on Daniel and thoughts on Revelation are God's helping hand. They are, but they're not the final word upon, you know, Daniel, especially, you know, Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 45, that's for sure. Um, and yet many people are taking what Uriah Smith has done as if this is, an inspired book and and somehow that it's without fault and that we need to follow it and and we can see here that he's completely wrong in applying the 1260 years uh to the papacy so i hope that summary was uh useful for people any questions from anybody else right now okay now here we come to the final portion of Smith's article, Daniel 12, sub D. Again, the symbols that are addressed here, 18th of July, 1871. He begins here with verses 8, 9, and 10. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel. For the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now, is there anything? So, I, I, yeah. yeah, there's something here that, so when we go back to this idea that Daniel as a prophet, he's representing God's people, right? In vision. Right. So when he doesn't understand, even if he personally understood, but, you know, he doesn't, but he's representing our lack of understanding or the lack of understanding of God's people that needs to be revealed, right? So what's being revealed to Daniel, all of this, him understanding um, <clears throat> of the Mara, him understanding um, the Debar, right? So that is, you know, the vision and the commandments to restore and build Jerusalem, and here to understand the chazon, um, that is representing us coming to understand it, correct? Right. So when he doesn't understand, it means we don't understand, and then we understand these books or these words are going to be sealed up until the time of the end. So um, there's another point which when we get to it, I, I want to go over as well that I was thinking about Um regarding uh, verse 10, but we, we'll, we'll look at what he says first again on verse 10. But So we know that these things are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Now, Daniel, of course, is unsealed in Millerite history, right? That's going to be the little book that's open. So we talked about this before. The little book is open. That's the book of Daniel. And we're then going to make an application of it to our time, uh, to being that portion of Daniel, which we've called Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. But that's going to be uh, what we are going to eat that's going to bring this uh, sweetness in our mouth and the bitterness in our belly, correct? Right. Okay. 
So anyway, that's but we're going to comment on more of this as as we go on. But we'll read what he says first. Okay. How forcibly we are reminded by Daniel's solicitude to understand fully all that had been shown him of Peter's words when he speaks of the prophets inquiring and searching diligently to understand the predictions concerning the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And also of the fact that not unto themselves, but unto us did they minister. How little were some of the prophets permitted to understand what they wrote? But they did not therefore refuse to write. If God required it, they knew that in due time, he would see that his people derived from their writings all the benefit that he intended. So the language here used to Daniel was the same as telling him that when the right time should come, the wise would understand the meaning of what he had written and be profited thereby. The time of the end was the time in which the Spirit of God was to break the seal from off this book. And consequently, this was the time during which the wise should understand. While the wicked, lost to all sense of the value of of eternal truth, with hearts callous and hardened in sin, grow continually more wicked and more blind. None of the wicked understand. The efforts of the wise to understand, they call folly and presumption, and ask in searing, sneering mockery, where is the promise of his coming? And should the question be raised, of what time and what generation speaketh the prophet this? The solemn answer would be, of the present time and of the generation now before us. This language of the prophet is now receiving the most striking fulfillment. Now that, he continues, the phraseology of verse 10 seems... Okay, to- okay. Let's go back just so a couple of points here. Good. Um, now, if we're going to say that it's in his time, so we're going to see that there's there's going to be some problems there. So it is true in the Millerite history that this, this book is going to be unsealed. Right. But we know that it goes all of the way to the second coming of Christ. It goes to our time. And um, so... One of the things that we have seen in looking at Daniel chapter 11 is that it's not just in verse 40b where we get 1989. We also saw this earlier in Daniel chapter 11. These two times of the end are are really being referenced. That there is a time of the end in Millerite history in which the book of Daniel is unsealed, but we know that it's it's going to tie us to uh, Revelation chapter 10 where we're going to see the seven thunders that are sealed up. So even though we have the book of Daniel unsealed, we also have the sealing up of the seven thunders. So this idea that Millerite history is being repeated and that we are repeating Millerite history is in scripture directly. It's just never been noticed until this movement came along. So we've always used Alan White's quotes but we can now see more clearly in the book of Daniel, and especially in Daniel 11 and 12, as we connect it to the book of Revelation, that Millerite history must be repeated based upon these scriptures. And, and this is just totally not understood except by this movement. And again, you know, this is what this movement is really kind of rejecting, uh, the ability to understand that. So, I mean, I, I know I keep emphasizing, you know, what Jeff is doing now, but what he's doing now is basically undoing what he uh, had been given to do as his primary message. And, it, and it's sort of awkward watching it, uh, like reading his papers and, and listening to what he's saying, to see how much he's backtracking. And and not just backtracking, but then because he's rejecting this light, going off onto another path. So even though he's trying to say, well, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to go back because we went on the wrong course going to July 18, 2020, um, he's not really successfully able to do that. Right? It's just impossible to do. So I think this is um, really, really important, what we're, what we're coming to understand here. I don't know if anybody has thoughts on that. 
well, as I've been going through this, I'm seeing a lot more relevance in our time than I would in Smith's time. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I, it's like, I mean, of course, he's not in our time and he can't see our time, right? It's just, you know, it's not possible for him to do that. Uh, but we're in our time that we can see our time and we can see that if, if Smith was right, uh, and this is the problem with Adventism. If since we don't have any new light, that Adventism really has not progressed, we have no real explanation for why we are in the situation we're in today. Right? The Lord has delayed His coming is really much more the the sentiment of most Adventists today. It's like so much time has gone on. How can we still believe in these things? Uh, that were given to us back then. Obviously, they were just, you know, a bunch of uneducated farmers and didn't really know anything, and they weren't very sophisticated. Um, and scholarship has brought us so much farther. Um, you know, so there's some good things about Adventism, but really, um, I mean, why should we even exist? Uh, in, in some ways, that's really the sentiment, uh, and I think most of you would agree. That, that we see within Adventism today. And we want to be recognized as part of the other churches. And thinking that we have something to contribute, uh, maybe, you know, the keeping of the Sabbath, you know, both well, as some people say, well, one day in seven holy, and, you know, that God is being judged. Um, you know, the, the sanctuary message gives us some idea about God being judged. But, of course, we don't believe in, in the timing of it. <coughs> Um, so I understand modern Adventism quite well, thinking of the scholars and, and what you get from like Sector Magazine and so forth. And, and that's why this message had such an appeal to me, because I realized either Adventism was dead and, and, and there would be no reason to be an Adventist, you know, if all of these things are not true. So why be an Adventist? And, and, or, that there was light to come, and this movement provided that light so that we could see clearly that, I mean, to me, this movement was Adventism's last gasp, as far as I'm concerned. It was, it was, it was either true, the 2520 and all of these things, or Adventism wasn't true, right? Once I went back to study the foundation, I was studying it. Um, personally, to see, is Adventism true? And if this is true, then this is pretty amazing. And as I continued to study the 2520, um, I recognized that Adventism was on a much more solid footing than I'd ever imagined. And, 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 and that's what this movement has, has shown. And I wish I could show it to other Adventists that they would be willing to look at it, but very few Adventists want to. And that's because there are so many um, other voices out there that are, are demanding to be heard, the anti-Trinitarians, uh, feast keepers, uh, character of God, um, um, all kinds of different uh, groups that, that, you know, use the charts and even talk about, you know, pioneer Adventism or historic Adventism, and yet they have no understanding of these things. There are groups that talk about the 2520, but they will not go beyond Miller's understanding of it. That is, they won't have the prophetic mirror. Um, they don't want to see the two 1260s, right? And so, so there's all these different voices, and how, how are people going to sort through it all? You know, that's, that's really the question. How so God must have to do something. He must take this work into his hands and accomplish it. And so right now, what we're doing is we're just doing what God has asked us to do. But we don't know how God's going to use this in the end. So Dwight? Yeah. So, um, I know I'm talking a lot. Yeah. All right. I, I think these are important things. At least this is the things I've been thinking about as I've been working out in the field with the pickaxe. So. Okay. So, so I've been thinking about these things quite a bit. I have lots of time to think when all I have is an, an axe in my hand. Um, 
Anyway. Smith continues. The phraseology of verse 10 seems at first sight to be rather peculiar. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. How, it may be asked, can they be made white and then tried as the language would seem to imply when it is by being tried that they are purified and made white? Answer, the language doubtless describes a process which is many times repeated in the experience of those who during this time are being made ready for the coming and kingdom of the Lord. They are purified and made white to a certain degree and in comparison with their former condition. Then they are tried. Greater tests are brought to bear upon them. If they endure these, the work of purification is thus carried to a still deeper degree. The process of being made white is made to reach a still higher stage. And having reached this state, they are tried again, resulting in their being further purified and made white. And thus the process goes on till characters are developed, which will stand the test of the great day. And a place is reached beyond which there is no need of further trial. Now, here again, Smith is trying to take the verses in a very lineal manner, progression from one to the next to the next. Is that the way we should apply that in this on verse 10? Well, definitely not. Now, he has also admitted that things aren't in order. Right. So so looking at these verses here, um, first there's going to be in the context of that he he hears and does not understand, right? So that's really going to be the first thing if you're putting these three verses together. Um, So he's going to ask what shall be the end of these things. Now, we know that he's going to go his way. Daniel's going to go his way, right? Right. And... um, and, and the words are going to be closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Now, we would say the time of the end is 1798. Okay. But now when we move to this purified, made white, and tried, that would bring us into our history. Because we have already addre- addressed this in Daniel 11, verse 35, where we saw um, the different order of these three. Right. So we're going to have, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and purge them and make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a a time appointed, right? Now, we we took that there in Daniel 11, verse 35, and what we're seeing is that the time of the end and the time appointed is not really saying that they're going to be purged, made white, and try, or try, purged, and made white up until the time of the end but that this time of the end is 1798 and this time appointed, the Moed is 1844, and that this is referring to the three angels' messages in Millerite history itself in verse 35, right? That's how we came to understand that verse. Right. So the order there uh, to try to purge and to make them white, um, that it's being different in uh, chapter 12, uh, uh, Verse um, verse ten, right? Shall be purified, made white, and tried. That the tried is at the end. I think, even though it's not a complete chiastic reverse, I would say that this this is referring to our time. That trying there is the time of Jacob's trouble. So this is in our time, and it's going to be uh, this progression um, of this. The first and second angel's messages are repeated in our history. And the third angel's message is, um, you know, we'll say, when when does the third angel's message, when is it empowered in our history? Because in all these other histories, the third angel's message arrives, but it's never empowered. Right. So, So in our history, when would we really say that it is empowered? We can say, you know, it arrives. You know, we, we, we can put different places in rise. It, it, it obviously arrives October 22nd, 1844. And, and it continues to be present truth. And then it's it, when the second angel joins it at 9-11, we can see that then it's going to swell into a loud cry. Um, and and you know, we could argue maybe the loud cry is the empowerment. But, but that's really more about the second angel because it's paralleling 
uh, Millerite history with the Midnight Cry, which is the second angel. And so we can say, well, is it when probation closes? Because that's when the third angel arrived was the close of probation in Millerite history, October 22nd, 1844. So maybe the best way to say is that, that it's empowered with the close of probation when Christ stands up. And that what we see there following, which is the trying, that is going to be the plagues being poured out upon the wicked. The wicked don't turn from their wickedness. And then uh, the righteous don't turn from their righteousness. And, and it ultimately culminates in the experience of the 144,000 during the time of Jacob's trouble, when Christ's character is perfectly reproduced in his people, and the last bit of earthly earthiness is removed, then when Christ's character is perfectly reproduced in his people, then shall he come to claim them as his own. So then those series of events, such as the special resurrection, uh, occurring in preparation for Christ to then come, so that you know those that pierced him can be there to see Christ coming, and um, those that died under the, the third angel can be there to see Christ coming. So does that make sense? Are there any comments? I don't have a difficulty with what you just said. I don't know how anybody else feels, though. Uh, is it not uh, like uh, it's empowered at uh, Sandalo? I don't understand. Yeah, what, what's your question? Or things like no, question. I'm saying that I'm saying the third angel's message. Is it not uh, empowered at the Sunday law? Third angel's message oh. part of the Sunday law? Is it empowered at the Sunday law? And I would say no. And, and the reason why is I would see that more as a type of formalization. So, so the question is, because the Sunday law as a symbol, is 9-11 a symbol of the Sunday law? Do we, do we establish that 9-11 is when the Sunday law arrives in our history? Right. So, so the Sunday law is arriving with the second angel. Right. So we went through this in the book of Judges that 9-11 represents both the empowerment of uh, the first angel and the arrival of the second. And as we continued to study through this, we came to understand that, that 9-11 in our history, as we zoom in, is really about the arrival of, of the Sunday law in our history. And, and that's the second angel. So that's going to join with the third angel, which has arrived October 22nd, 1844. And they're going to swell to a loud cry. During the loud cry is the time of the Sunday law. So, so there would have to be an empowerment of that second angel. So we would, we would now then say more specifically that the Sunday law, when it arrives, is the empowerment of the, of the second angel in our history. And, and that would then uh, that's, that's, and, and, and the third angel, I mean, the third angel, we, we sometimes can say, you know, it was empowered in 1888, but righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity. And so when it starts to be worked out, we see the separation of the two classes in our history under the Sunday law, people making their choice, the seal of God uh, being placed upon, uh, upon on his saints. And, and those receiving the mark of the beast. We would have to say that it's, it, it definitely can't be the empowerment of the third. It has to be the close of probation that's then, or not the, yeah, the, that the third angel is empowered. So we see it formalized in our history in the loud cry, but ultimately it's when probation is closed that we would have the third angel empowered. That's my understanding. I don't know if other people agree or not. I don't know if I explained it very well, but any thoughts on that? Well, I would normally connect 9-11 with the sprinkling and then the full outpouring. Uh, well, this, with uh, sorry, 9-11 with the sprinkling that Christ came down uh, after he uh, presented himself to the Father on the day of the first fruits. And then you have the full outpouring in Pentecost, uh, 49 days later. So that would be typifying. So that would be like the Sunday law, the full outpouring with 9-11 being the sprinkling. So to me, I would say that would be 
the Sunday law would be like an empowerment then of the third angel's message. Then okay. In a fuller yeah. measure. So which, so which, which line are you in though? Like, because I agree with you, but in which line, right? So we have different lines that exist. So are you talking about the whole big line from Ellen White's day, or are you talking about more specifically the line within this movement, right? Because within this movement, I would agree, with it, or within, within the repeat of history. But when I talk about the, the empowerment of the third angel, I'm talking about the whole big line that Ellen White has. So with the third angel arriving on October 22nd, 1844. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, I sort of have a, yeah, I get what you're saying, yes. Yeah, because it depends where we're zoomed in. Because we, because we have many different lines in which we can say, you know, a first angel arrived, you know, a second angel arrived, you know, first angels empowered, second angels empowered. So, and and I think we we sorted that out fairly well with, um, um you know, the study and judges and understanding those lines. So I, I'm looking at the much bigger line, not Jeff's line, because in Jeff's line, 9-11 is not the arrival of the Sunday law, right? He's going to have 9-11 to the Sunday law, being from uh, Millerite history from the first day of the first month, the Sunday law is going to be the 10th day of the seventh month, right? You know, that line we had in 2016. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so that line of Jeff, is a zoom into the Sunday law, right? Yes. But it's, so that's what I'm saying is that the Sunday law arrives at 9-11 in the sense that that history is the history of the Sunday law. We've been in the history of the Sunday law since 9-11. But that's, that's taking, and that's not something that Ellen White, she never really addresses that line in, in that specific way, right? When she's talking about, you know, the second angel joins uh, the third, you know, that's that's Revelation 18. That's the Sunday law, right? But we can see clearly that that Sunday law that she's talking about, we had placed that at 9-11. And, and A.T. Jones in 1892, he's going to say that the, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down in his history. And Ellen White's going to appear to agree with him. And because in that history... There is an application you can make of that, especially dealing with 1888 and then the rejection of that message and what happens uh, dealing with uh, uh, the Blair Bill and, and um, uh, the Sunday Law with uh, uh, Chicago's World Fair, or not World Fair, but the Chicago, yeah, it's the World Fair in Chicago. Um, um, so, so those events, we can see that there's definitely a parallel. To our history, but in mm -hmm. so in our history, when we look at 9/11, that's not really something that Ellen White's addressing in in that way within her lines. But we can see it within this this history. So mm -hmm. uh, hopefully that makes more sense to people. Hey, Dwight. Yes. <laughs> it's been a long couple of days. Oh, I know, I know. I, I really appreciate you doing this. I wish I could do, I'm, I'm going to try to see if, because I really like what you're doing with this study here, looking at Uriah Smith, and I think we need to do it. You know, obviously here are the limitations of the internet, um, but being on the phone, I, I, I do think I might be able to do lead out in some studies, um, because, you know, I could bring things up um, on the screen. Uh, there'd just be a bit of delay with the, com the computer part of it, but the phone seems to be working pretty good. It is. But, um, but um, so, no, so what we have here then, um, yeah, I wish that dog wasn't barking all the time. Um, so you can go on. we got about uh, 15 minutes left right. today. Here we segue into verse 11. And, as the verse reads, and from the time that the daily shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now, it's intriguing 
because in this portion, we introduce this next prophetic period that is found at this point only within the book of Daniel. So Smith, in this paragraph, writes, we have here a new prophetic period introduced, namely 1,290 prophetic days, which would denote the same number of literal years. From the reading of the text, some have inferred, though the inference is not a necessary one, that this period begins with the setting up of the abomination of desolation or the papal power in 538. And it's interesting that he then says, consequently extends this to 1828. But while we find nothing in that year to mark their their termination, we do find evidence at the margin that they begin before the setting up of the papal abomination. The margin reads, to set up the abomination and continue. With this reading, the text would stand thus. And from the time that the daily sacrifice or the daily shall be taken away to set up or in order to set up the abomination that maketh desolate, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. The daily has already been shown to be not the daily sacrifice of the Jews, but the daily or continual abomination, that is paganism. Here he gives reference back to chapter 813. This had to be taken away to prepare the way for the papacy. For the historical event showing how this was to be accomplished in 508, see regarding chapter 1131. We are not told directly to what event these 1290 days reach. Inasmuch as their commencement is marked by a work which takes place to prepare the way for the setting up of the papacy, it would be most natural to conclude that their end would be marked by the cessation of papal supremacy. Counting back then 1,290 years from 1798, we have the year 508 where it has been shown that paganism was taken away 30 years before the setting up of the papacy. This period is doubtless given to show the date or the taking away of the daily, and it is the only one which does this. The two periods, therefore, of 1290 and 1260 days terminate together in 1798, the one beginning in 538, the other in 508, 30 years previous. Now, do we have any issue with what Smith is presenting here? Well, I don't think we have an issue with it, other than the way in which he's he's deriving 508 is not really how Miller did it. That is, Miller didn't count 1,290 days backwards. So what are the dates, what are the three dates that that William Miller was given by God? He, He says here there's three dates. 677, 538, and 490, wasn't it? Or 508? No, 677, 508, and and 457 BC. Okay. Right. So 677 BC, 457 BC, and um, 508 AD. 508, right? So he wasn't given 538. He doesn't say I was, you know, uh, I can't remember the word that he uses. but Alan White talks about um, the, the um, he's uh, trying to think of the, the verb, but the chain of truth, right? So he was given the chain of truth. He, so he was given the starting points, and and he gives us those three dates. Right. So so Uriah Smith here is kind of using 538, 1798 already and then working back from 1798 to get to 508. But that's not how Miller did it, right? He's going to be given 508, and from there, he's going to get the 1290 and the 1335. But he never says, I was given 538, right? So the 538, in in a sense, he would start with the 1290, and there then work back to 538, to having... Right, so it's the opposite way in which Miller derived these things, in my understanding of it. And and he's always going to talk about those periods, too, as the three main periods that he has. That is, 
the, the 70 weeks, the 2300 days, and the 1335s. Right. right? Because he, he's concerned about these periods that end in 1843, not so much, even though 1798 is there. It's not one of his primary periods. So he's got the 2300 days in which the 70 weeks is apart, right? The, that they start together, and then the 1335 and the 2300 days that end together. Right. So, so this difference, I think, is, is, is quite important in how Miller came to understand things. And, and then, of course, we have uh, the, 20, the, the 2520, right? So obviously that, that becomes an important part as well. So he sees, he sees the 2300 days of the 70 weeks as, as, as a unit, in a sense, right? They're, they're part of the same prophecy. And then the 2520, which is the first one he finds. Um, that, 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 so he's got these, I guess you would say he has three periods ending in 1843 in his understanding. So the 2520, the 2300 days, and, and the 1335. So the 1798 date, even though it's there in Miller's understanding because of the, the 1335 and the 1290, right, working together. It's, it, he doesn't see it the way that Adventists do today. That is, we, we, we think a lot about the 1260. We don't really talk much about the 1290 or the 1335 as Seventh-day Seventh Adventists. Right? Even, even sometimes presentations on the prophecies in our evangelistic series, at least in the past, they don't even touch on the 1335 right? or the 1290. They're, they're going to deal with the 1260, they're going to deal with the 70 weeks, and they're going to deal with the 2300 days. So you can see the difference, um, and, and you can see this already sort of happening even with Uriah Smith here at this point, that the 1260 becomes more prominent, and the 1290 and the 1335 are just almost like secondary considerations. Right. Does that make sense? Of how no, he's doing it? That's it, correct. Yeah. Because he's he just so, does not seem to wish to give credence to these other periods. Yeah, it, it, they're 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 minor. They're they're a product of the 1260 rather than main periods. And and of course the 1335. Look, I'm, you know, that's not really understood within Adventism. I'm not sure what he's going to do here uh, exactly, because that's not affected by the the no zero year. Right. State. Right. So, so Adventists generally just kind of ignored that, and and it was even a bit of a problem on the 1850 chart in that they they made some corrections. They first gave some dates. If you look in the 1850, they whited them out and then changed them um, because they weren't quite sure in 1850 exactly how to address those periods. So they would kind of just put them as like a span of a year. But we really understand that the 1335 ends sunset on April 18th, 1844. It's the end of Miller's prophecy. And blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1335. So, you know, we'll deal with that probably in the next uh, paragraph there. Right. But, but that's the thing that I see here is just there's this groundwork already being laid. And, and I don't think Smith is, is totally responsible for it. I think that the 2520 part of it was what they expected to happen in 1844, you know, on October 22nd, didn't happen. And they could see Christ moving from the holy to the most holy, so they could see the sanctuary message. But they didn't really know how the 2520 fit in. And so this idea that, that Daniel doesn't really understand it I really think that we see that the 2520, what, what Daniel's trying to understand here, Daniel chapter 11 and 12, are really addressing that 2520. And Daniel doesn't understand it. So its understanding is unsealed. That is, the experience of the Millerites has to be unsealed in order for us to understand the 2520. So another way to look at it is that the 2520 was hid from Seventh-day Adventists. So even though Hiram Edson presented his studies, he didn't put it all together. He didn't create the prophetic mirror. He could see that there was 
two other 1260s, the Times of the Gentiles, but nobody picked up on it. Nobody advanced that knowledge. You know, he didn't even really finish his series of articles. He did seven articles. Um, they weren't, weren't really finished. Now, he was busy working in the fields, so he didn't have time maybe to finish them. It could be that they lost interest in uh, the articles, that people were saying, well, this is kind of a waste of uh, um, space in the Review and Herald. We don't know. Nobody tells us what the reaction was to Hiram Edson's articles. We have no account of anybody saying anything about his articles, right? No discussion. Adventism is just pretty much silent about it. And and, and almost there's almost complete silence regarding the 2520 after that, right? You, you just don't see a discussion. That's why this idea that the 2520 was rejected, we have no record of any discussion of the 2520 where the church officially rejects the 2520, right? You can say, well, in 1863, they made a new chart, and so they rejected the 2520. But you could say, well, there's no 1260 on that chart. Did they reject the 1260 as well? There's no 1290 or 1335. You know, the chart is, is a different type of chart. And you can also look at the, the key to the prophetic chart in 1863, that Uriah Smith, who wrote the key, has 677 BC as the start. So he still retains 677 BC, which is going to give you the 2520. It's in the key. And, and he doesn't have the 1260 mentioned or anything in the key to the prophetic chart. So since he gives you 677, you, all, what we could say is that the 2520 is hidden in 1863, not really rejected. It's, it's just hidden from their sight. They're blind to it. And in our history, this is opened up. And, and so people could look at the 1843 chart and, you know, people like Eugene Pruitt and, and see it on his wall because he had it hanging on his wall in his room and, and wonder about it, but not really do anything with it. And in 1989, Peter Plum, a friend of mine in Kelly's, he comes to understand the 2520, right? But it's going to take time until we put together the whole prophetic mirror. So, so this movement, I mean, in some ways you can say it is the 2520 movement, but it comes because we're repeating Millerite history. And what was sealed up in Millerite history is unsealed in our time, in the Seven Thunders. Okay, right? So um, our time is up. Yep. So we have a little bit to finish. And then there's something else that I will try to have ready for us to look at tomorrow. Okay. So, any other comments or questions at this point? Yeah, I have no uh, issue here with the 508. Yes. All of um, when we look at what uh, Smith says about it, yes. his understanding of it, and even Miller's, and there was quite a, a varied understanding of what actually took place that defined what is the taking away of paganism. So that's, uh, that's another sort of topic, but he addresses that probably yeah. elsewhere here. So, yeah, we uh, really need to address that, Stephen, because, I mean, I think of all the things that's the most confusing for Seventh-day Adventists is what happens in 508 and what happens in 538. And that is, there's so many different opinions, and many of them wrong. Yes, even Jeff. And uh, mm -hmm. his understanding of what took place in 538 wasn't uh, correct. Yeah. Well. And, and this, so this weakness within Adventism is one of the reasons that we've had the 1290 and the 1335 neglected. People really haven't known what to do with it. And I think that's something that we really have to nail down. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Well, thanks, thanks for that, Stephen. Yes, thank you. Okay, so shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father, thank you for this time that we were able to spend together today. Thank you for this study. Thank you for helping us to consider these points and to join together and discuss these different points and how we should approach them. Direct us through this day. Be with us, we ask. 
so that your character may be shown to all with whom we come in contact. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.